I'm Carol Sinek Schmidt, and I am uh, on this work with the Historical Commission. John Black over there is the chair, so if you have any questions or would like to volunteer for the Historical Commission, talk to John, right? If you haven't heard it before, in the front of these books, they're five dollars each. It's the history of East Brandywine. It's really great. But in the very front, there's a poem uh, by Thomas Buchanan Reed that is beautiful. I am not going to read the whole thing because Olivia has great stuff to tell us. But it's called The Stranger on the Sill. And he talks about where he lived on um, Lindell Corner Catch Road about the barn and the orchard and so forth. And I just love the way he ends it, and I'm just going to read that part. My heart still lingers with them all, yet stranger on my native sill, step lightly, for I love it still. And I just thought that was worth sharing. Um, Olivia Gruber, Fol Florek, I wanna, didn't want to pronounce that wrong, is the associate professor of art history at Delaware County Community College. She's taught there since 2012. She's a historian of modern art. Um, she has a book coming out from the University of Delaware. Did you bring any? Or it's not, it's not out yet. Um, called The Celebrity Monarch, Empress Elizabeth and the Modern Female Portrait. Doesn't that sound interesting? We'll have to look forward to that. And she curates a yearly ex exhibition of contemporary art in addition to her teaching responsibilities. Uh, she's been the recipient of fellowships and grants from, uh, among others, the Social Science Research Council, uh, the Fulbright Commission, and the American Council of Learned Stud Societies. She earned her doctorate in art history at Rutgers the State University of New Jersey, and her Bachelor of Arts at Swarthmore. And so we will welcome Olivia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol, for that kind introduction and for the, in, the invitation to present here today. I, I also want to thank Corinne Caldwell um, for reaching out to the college to find someone to speak on this really interesting topic. I feel like it's especially appropriate to talk about Thomas Buchanan Reed because the historical marker that this commission um, put up is actually right next to the sign for Delaware County Community College on 322. And so whenever I pass that, I always see the marker at the same time. And so this was a wonderful opportunity for me to learn about him. Um, because when the commission first reached out to me, to be honest, I believed that the content might be a little far afield from what I typically study. Um, so my expertise is in 19th century portraiture, but like Carol said, the majority of my publications consider images of, of female celebrities, uh, specifically Empress Elizabeth of Austria, who was a famous beauty. Um, in my book, I argue that her painted and photographic portraits prefigure many of the ways um, that we think about celebrity today in the 20th and the 21st centuries. However, in diving into the literature on Reed and the subject of this painting, General Philip Sheridan, I realized that theirs is also a story about celebrity. So, during their lifetimes, Reed and Sheridan were both household names on here and in Europe. You hold in your hands Reed's poem about Sheridan's 1864 ride to rally his troops at Cedar Creek, which was printed in newspapers across the Union and even played a role in Abraham Lincoln's re-election campaign. Reed's painting, Sheridan's Ride, which forms the central evidence in today's discussion, was so popular that Reed actually produced 17 copies of it. His horse, Rienzi, who is as much a focus of the poem as Sheridan himself, also became a celebrity of sorts. Upon his death, the horse was taxidermized, and it's currently on view at the Smithsonian Museum of American History. Yet today, Reed is largely unknown even here in his birthplace, and William Sherman and Ulysses Grant have supplanted Sheridan as the first names that most Americans conjure when remembering Union generals. 
What happened? How did Reed go from a poet and an artist whose output shaped the development of political careers to a figure who is barely a footnote in most studies of art on the Civil War? The answer lies in Reed's reliance upon an art form that was in the process of being supplanted by a new technology, photography. Today, we will look at how Reed's success rested upon the historical primacy of painting as a tool for commemorating military victory. I will argue that Sheridan's ride represents a considerable breach from the military paintings prior to the Civil War in that it glorifies Sheridan alone rather than placing him within a crowded field of combat. Yet the choice that made it a beloved image in the decade immediately following the war is also the reason that few study the paintings today. It's failure to capture the experience of the conflict. For that type of documentation, today we turn to photography. The Civil War was the first American conflict to be recorded using this technology, but its capabilities in the 1860 were far more limited than even a decade later. The plates required long exposure time, meaning that it could not capture any movement. Printing technologies had not yet advanced to allow photographs to be reproduced in illustrated magazines, so for contemporary viewers, photography was not necessarily the de facto visual resource for current events. Reed's portrait of Sheridan exists at the boundary of these limitations, and the ascendancy of photography as a journalistic tool resulted in the obliteration of images like Sheridan's ride. Reed and Sheridan entered public discourse during a period of dramatic change for the definition of celebrity. Prior to the 18th century, fame rested upon the honor of a position, such as the status associated with a royal dynasty. However, beginning in the late 18th century, an emphasis on individual accomplishment rather than inherited position opens up celebrity to many other people in the public sphere, such as actors, authors, military heroes, and politicians. In the beginning of the 19th century, celebrity status is seemingly available to anyone who can distinguish themselves through their actions. Reed himself is an example of this type of fame. He earned it through his achievements rather than through his birth. Reed's celebrity is also inextricable from the Industrial Revolution. Beginning in 1814, steam-driven printing presses meant that text and some images could be reproduced faster and cheaper, resulting in an explosion of printed materials. It was within these inexpensive magazines that Reed's poetry and engravings after his paintings received their wide acclaim. The unlikely path that Reed followed to achieve this acclaim, to me, speaks to the strength of his abilities as well as what must have been a really compelling personality. So I realize that all my text is not very visible, I'll, so I'll just do my best. Um, so he was born exactly 200 years ago here in Corner Ketch. He never had any formal training in either literature or painting. He attended school at Hopewell. And upon his, his yeah, <laughs> and upon his grandfather's death in 1836, his family sold their farm to a stranger, and it's it's that choice to give up the family farm that's commemorated in the poem that Carol recited at the beginning. So Reed was apprenticed locally, but it didn't work out, and he left Chester County, moving first to Philadelphia and eventually Ohio, and this marked the beginning of a lifetime of moving from urban center to urban center. For the rest of his life, Reed never lived anywhere for more than a few years. In Ohio, he worked odd jobs from cigar rolling to sign painting, all the while writing poetry and practicing drawing. His portraits caught the attention of a local businessman who gave Reed his own studio where he could make portraits on commission, including a portrait of the then presidential candidate, William Henry Harrison. It's the success of this painting that funds another move to Boston in 1841, where he be befriends Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the poet and Harvard professor. Through Longfellow's network, Reed begins publishing and painting more extensively, eventually building enough of a reputation to move back to Philadelphia and open his own studio. In 1850, he embarks upon his first trip to Europe, where he had already lined up many um, commissions in both London and Florence. 
And it's during these trips that he interacts with a veritable who's who of poetry and art in the European world, including Alfred Lord Tennyson, uh, the pre-Raphaelite artists William Holman Hunt and Dante Rossetti, and Emmanuel Leutz, who we know so well from painting Washington Crossing the Delaware. So over the next decade, Reed moves between Italy and Philadelphia. During this time, he experiences considerable tragedy when both his wife and his daughter die of cholera in Florence, but also astounding successes, such as in 1856, when he exhibits his paintings in Congress and then visits President Franklin Pierce multiple times in the White House. Um, when the Civil War breaks out in 1861, he's living in Florence, but he decides that he really has to come back to the States because he wants to support the Union cause. And in order to do that, he doesn't enlist in the Army per se, but rather he partners with an actor, James Murdoch. So James Murdoch has uh, embarked upon a series of public events in which he's trying to raise money for the Union cause. Uh, so in these events, they're, they're sort of comparable to like USO performances because they're for both soldiers but also people who are going to donate money to the Union cause. So the performances revolve around uh, Reed's poetry. Reed produces these patriotic verses and then Murdoch, who's he's like this great Shakespearean actor in the 19th century, he performs them for the crowds. It's within these portraits that Reed becomes especially famous in the United States, so much so that even Abraham Lincoln confesses to carrying copies of his poems on his person. So it's in preparation for one of these performances that he writes Sheridan's Ride. So according to the legend, Reed was sitting at breakfast with the actor Murdoch, and his brother-in-law comes in and places a copy of Harper's Weekly on the table, points to the illustration on the cover, and says to Reed, there is a poem in that picture. Reed immediately sets to work and, and composes Sheridan's Ride. He finished the poem in time for Murdoch to perform it that night at a fundraiser, and it's so popular that it's reprinted across the North with astounding speed. The poem suggests, too, that Reed, he kind of knew it was going to be a big deal. So I'd like you to look at the final stanza, particularly the line where he predicts future artistic representation. He writes, quote, when their statues are placed on high. And Reed was right. In the early 20th century, many equestrian portraits of Sheridan appear across the United States, such as this one by Gutzon Borglum on Sheridan Circle in Washington, DC. Gutzon Borglum, this is the same sculptor who goes on to design and manage the production of Mount Rushmore. Yet before 1864, Sheridan, who I have pictured here, he may have seen an unlikely candidate for such memorialization. Describing the physique of the five foot four inch Sheridan, Abraham Lincoln wrote that he was, quote, a chunky little chap, not enough neck to hang him, and such long arms that if his ankles itch, he can scratch them without stooping, end quote. The sketch artist, James E. Taylor, who covered Sheridan's campaign in the Shenandoah Valley, was more evocative, quote, his head was abnormally large, his body and arms were long, while his pedals were disproportionately short. Duck legs, in fact, end quote. However, this same artist notes that Sheridan, who is known by the nickname Little Phil, possessed, quote, in that little body, a tremendous energy and untiring vigilance that carried him to victory. It was Sheridan's vigor that propelled a comeback victory in the Shenandoah Valley that was a win for both the Union Army and Abraham Lincoln's re-election campaign. In the summer of 1864, the Confederates had regained territories across Virginia and led repeated incursions into the North that grew ever nearer to Washington, D.C. On August 23rd of that year, Lincoln told his cabinet members that he thought it, quote, exceedingly probable that this administration will not be re-elected in November. His challenger in the upcoming election was George B. McClellan, who was running on a peace platform. The devastating summer of 1864 had shifted the northern mood against the war, and the Union Army needed some decisive victories to change opinions. These victories came over the next few months in the Shenandoah Valley. 
To halt the Confederate advance in Virginia, Ulysses S. Grant instructed Sheridan to destroy the army, but also every settlement and town he encountered, a scorched earth tactic that would become Sheridan's trademark for the rest of his career. After a series of battles over six weeks in September and October, Sheridan's army appeared to have decimated the Confederates. So I'm putting up a map now that you really probably can't make it all, out at all, but it's the, the gist of what happened at Cedar Creek on October 19th. So on October 19th, with reinforcements from General Lee, the Confederates launched a surprise early morning attack on a group of Sheridan's army while they were still sleeping near the creek. They fled, leaving behind all of their supplies and provisions, even breakfast upon the table. Sheridan heard this artillery fire while still in Winchester about 12 miles away, not 20 as it says in the poem. And on the back of Rienzi, he sprints to rally his troops. Inspired by the return of Little Phil, the Union soldiers quickly regrouped, flanked the Confederates, and so fully routed them that they never occupied the Shenandoah Valley again, nor threatened the North with invasion. So Reed writes his poem on November 1st. On November 8th, Election Day, the poem Sheridan's Ride appears on the front page of the New York Tribune as an endorsement of Lincoln over the peace candidate McClellan. And so I have, that's the newspaper there in that red box, that's where the poem appeared. Uh, so Sheridan's ride encouraged voters to stay the course in the war, just as Sheridan himself had pushed his army to return to the fray at Cedar Creek. The success of the poem catapults Reed to an entirely new level of celebrity. He now holds international acclaim. But Reed received relatively little money off the poem itself, as the newspapers who printed it across the country did so without compensating the author. It is perhaps for this reason some years later that Reed returned to painting to further monetize his success. The painting commemorates the moment Sheridan returned to the fray. Rienzi leaps in from the right side of the frame, nostrils flaring, red ribbons flying, and every muscle in the horse's body tense, the pressure of the bridle leaving soft indentations on his neck. In contrast, Sheridan is expressionless, his cheeks barely reddened from the activity, and his torso upright and statuesque. The figure of horse and man are completely balanced, floating along a vertical axis, almost like a Christmas tree ornament. Reed strews the road with military detritus from the retreat. A cannonball, canteen, and the end of a rifle litter the foreground. In the background, emerging through the mist, appear the dim outlines of cavalry soldiers and a flag. One man imitates Sheridan's gesture, suggesting that the rally has become before our very eyes. Reed pulls many of these details from the poem itself, almost as if we ought to read the poem as we take in the painting. And so here on this slide, I've tried, I have arrows pointing to like the specific lines of the poem that match up with individual details from the painting. So he uses soft painterly strokes for the conical spray of dust at the feet of the horse, suggesting, quote, the dust like smoke from the cannon's mouth or the trail of a comet sweeping faster and faster, end quote. The stones at the foreground line the road like a creek imitating the, quote, arrowy alpine river, quote, metaphor that Reed developed to suggest the road flying beneath the horse. The cavalry in the background swell like the ocean. The wave of defeat checked its course there because the sight of the master compelled it to pause. And finally, the horse, Rienzi, who makes direct eye contact with the viewer, by the flash of his eye and his red nostrils play, he seemed to the whole great army to say, I have brought you Sheridan all the way. Indeed, the viewer holds the position of a bystander along the road, as if we are among the retreating soldiers who are being recalled by Sheridan's bravery. This direct engagement between the horse and the viewer marks one of the ways that Reed departs from previous illustrations of Sheridan's ride. Thomas Nast's wood engraving, which supposedly inspired Reed's original poem, depicts an almost frontal view of Rienzi atop 
of Sheridan atop Rienzi, flying through clouds of dust. In the background, three figures raise their hats to cheer Sheridan along, while another figure sits crumpled at their feet. The illustration is engaging. The horse is going to rocket out of the magazine and gallop past you, but it, it doesn't make eye contact in the same way as Reed's. James E. Taylor, the same guy who said Sheridan had duck legs, offered a very different interpretation of the event in Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. Here, we see Sheridan from behind, surrounded by his invigorated soldiers. You can see that Rienzi has just halted as Sheridan's cape is flapping in the wind. These details of the surrounding soldiers, their careful uniforms and the regimental flags, their momentum to follow Sheridan, also appear in a post-war 1868 engraving by Charles Schussela. One aspect that all of these representations share is an overscaling of Sheridan relative to Rienzi. Sheridan is way too large in comparison to the horse, who stood 16 hands, or about 5 foot 4 inches tall in life. As previously discussed, Sheridan had a long torso and short legs, but the choice to represent him this way is an abstraction that extends back to ancient Rome. Equestrian sculptures in Imperial Rome always overscaled their riders in order to focus attention on the sitter, who would otherwise be overshadowed by the scale of the horse. Reed's painting incorporates elements of each of these earlier models, but his painting puts a spotlight more solely on Sheridan, almost as if he's an actor on the stage. The items strewn about the ground appear like props, and the space behind him is so flattened as to suggest a dropped scenic background. These choices perhaps stem from Reed's own understanding of fame and its theatrical trappings. Reed's poem achieved prominence through an actor's performance, and Reed highlights the individual heroism in order to launch the painting to similar acclaim. Reed's gambit paid off. According to Eleanor James Harvey, curator of the 2012 National Gallery exhibition, The Civil War and American Art, it was Reed's focus on Sheridan as an isolated hero that made this canvas among the most successful paintings of the Civil War. These choices mark a significant departure from war paintings in the European tradition, such as the, the Death of General Wolfe, produced a century earlier by another Pennsylvania-born artist, Benjamin West. History paintings like this one were considered the highest form of subject matter by European academies of painting and sculpture. Designed to instruct the populace on morals and civic virtue, large-scale paintings of great historical events received the most critical attention and thus were the goal of all aspiring painters. In 1770, the American, Benjamin West, revolutionized this genre by representing a relatively contemporary event, the death of General Wolfe outside of Quebec during the French and Indian War only seven years earlier. Moreover, West painted the figures wearing contemporary clothing, a choice that many thought took away from the timeless heroism of the event. Previously, artists painted figures wearing ancient Greek costumes, but West argued, quote, the same truth that guide the pen of the historian should govern the paintbrush of the artist, end quote. Now, West might have stretched the truth a bit to arrange this dramatic composition. Wolf reclines at center, his upturned eyes evoking representations of the crucified Christ. Even though historical records suggest that Wolf died with only one other person, West surrounds his deathbed with various British, Canadian, and even a tattooed Native American. The success of West's strategies inspired many subsequent history paintings, most notably the German-American painting Emanuel Leutz's Washington Crossing the Delaware. Leutz's iconic painting incorporates many of the same choices as West's, both in terms of its composition and its subject matter. Both painters use the flag to point to the hero, whether it be Wolfe or Washington. Leutz fills Washington's boats with representatives of America's diverse population, including a black man near the front and a Native American in the back. Washington crossing the Delaware was wildly popular in the United States following its appearance at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1851. 
but Reed had an even more intimate familiarity with the painting, as he visited the artist's studio in Germany and saw this exact canvas on the easel as the artist was working on it. Now, despite the popularity of this style of history painting, there exist no comparable successful images from the Civil War. Harvey argues that this style was ill-suited to the new warfare practices that emerged during this conflict. There were few grand charges and decisive campaigns. Rather, trench warfare, long sieges, and forced marches filled the newspapers. Consequently, many American painters turned to landscapes to express patriotic fervor without the bloody details of actual combat. So this builds on a long history of America tran American transcendentalism, or the belief in the spiritual values of experiencing nature firsthand. These landscape paintings offered metaphorical interpretations of the conflict. An early example of this is Frederick Edwin Church's Our Banner in the Sky of 1861. So here, the sun sets over a craggy wilderness skyline. The sunlight illuminates the low clouds in red and white stripes, while a break in the clouds suggests the stars. Church made this sketch in response to a rally he attended in Union Square, where over 100,000 people gathered to celebrate the American flag which had been retrieved from Fort Sumter, where the war had begun in April of that year. The New York Daily Tribune declared that Church's painting was, quote, the most successful undertaking among our art producers since the outbreak of the Great Rebellion. So the painting was inspired by a battle, but its success lies in the abstract and patriotic fervor conjured by the flag. It links only contextually to the actual conflict at Fort Sumter. Reed's painting strikes a balance between the academic style of Loitz and the metaphorical landscape of church. Similar to Loitz, Reed's painting of Sheridan offers a direct representation of a war hero in the midst of a celebrated action and he depicts Sheridan in contemporary costume on a recognizably individualized horse. But Reed sidesteps the challenges of complex figural <coughs> compositions by shrouding Sheridan's soldiers in mist, and he also omits details of the conflict beyond the abandoned rifle, canteen, and the spent shell along the road. Sheridan's extended saber inspires patriotic fervor in a manner similar to Church's Our Banner, but Reed does not attempt to paint the Shenandoah landscape. Indeed, everything is secondary to Sheridan and his horse. Reed painted all of his versions of this portrait beginning in 1869 while living abroad again in Italy. It is likely that Reed would have lived much longer, but in 1871 he was in a carriage accident. He was riding by the Colosseum in Rome with the governor of New Jersey, who was visiting, and the carriage overturned into an excavation ditch. Uh, and he, he really never recovers. He returns to New York in the spring of 1872, and he dies there. He brought his copies of the painting on his, with him on the return journey home, and then following this untimely death, demand for the portrait soars. The poem remains part of the public psyche through its use in popular songs, and in the early 20th century, it was a staple in public school reading exercises. Yet today, the account and the paintings have been overshadowed by what, at the time, would have seen the most unlikely of media, photography. In the 1860s, photography existed at the margins of the established art world. It could not be reproduced on large scales, and its products did not resemble traditional war paintings. But today, we accept these photographs as the quintessential representation of the war, perhaps in part because of Ken Burns and the documentary films he has produced, such as 1990's Civil War, which is still the most watched program to ever appear on PBS. Burns's documentary style depends upon slow pans of photographs as backdrops to historical narration. The success of these, these photographs within Burns' documentaries rests on their achievement of what painting could not, a gripping depiction of the realities of civil war conflict. This history of war photography begins six years earlier. In March of 1855, the British photographer Roger Fenton arrived in Crimea to document the ongoing war with Russia. He had some restraints on his activity. 
The technique, wet collodion photography, in which a chemical coated glass serves as the negative, had a considerably long exposure time, which meant it could not capture actual action. Moreover, the process required photographers to travel with an entire wagon of chemicals and equipment. These wagons looked very similar to artillery wagons from a distance, which made them targets on a battlefield. Unable to enter into any actual battles, Fenton made his photographs after a conflict was completed. However, he also had an additional restraint that came directly from Queen Victoria. The photographs must be tasteful without any gruesome details of dead bodies. The most popular image Fenton produced was called The Valley of the Shadow of Death, in which he captures a desolate road strewn with spent cannonballs. Fenton exhibited the photograph in London later that year, where a critic admired its, quote, terrible suggestions, not merely those awakened in the memory, but actually brought materially before the eyes, end quote. Ironically, the content of the photograph was staged. Fenton rearranged the cannonballs to ensure that there was some element of the conflict visible in the image. Much of the melancholy of the photograph lies not necessarily in its content, but rather in its poetic title taken from Psalm 23. Though such a choice seems to contradict the documentary quality of the photograph, Fenton's image was taken as an accurate representation of the experience of British soldiers in Crimea. American photographers faced similar technological restraints in 1861. Long exposure times for the sensitized plate and equipment wagons that appeared dangerously similar to artillery supplies. However, without any censoring of their content, photographers incorporated all of the gruesome details. These photographers were sent by photographic studios based in New York and Washington, primarily to take portraits of soldiers, but they were also paid to document the battlefields. Similar to Fenton in Crimea, this documentation took place at the conclusion of a conflict. Fenton may have moved cannonballs, but American photographers routinely moved about the dead bodies of soldiers in order to create their compelling images. Their goals in these arrangements were both aesthetic and documentary. They wanted viewers to understand the devastation of the battlefield, but they recognized that traditional devices of painted landscapes could also serve as communicative strategies here. And just as a heads up, there are dead bodies in the, in the image that I am about to show. So this title, Harvest of Death, which depicts the Gettysburg battlefield, photographer Timothy O'Sullivan arranged the dead in a long diagonal bisecting the foreground. In the middle ground, a series of bodies moves the eye toward a stationary horse and rider near the horizon line, suggesting that the dead extended well beyond the scope of the lens. O'Sullivan lifted this layering of foreground, middle ground, and background directly from existing American landscape painting practice, such as this example by Thomas Cole. Cole's 1845 canvas features a diagonal line of rocks in the lower left that identifies the area closest to the viewer. Extending into the middle ground is another diagonal tree line, which eventually brings the eye to a stationary mountain peak marking the furthest reaches of the sky. O'Sullivan replicated this zigzagging patterns to move his, battle, move his viewers into the battlefield in the same way Cole directed his viewers into the landscape. Photographs like this are what most Americans today imagine when thinking of the Civil War but contemporary viewers would not have been familiar with them. Photographic studios owned by Andrew Gardner and Matthew Brady exhibited war photographs in their New York City and Washington DC galleries, but printing technology had not yet advanced enough to reproduce photographs in magazines or newspapers. After the war, Andrew Gardner attempted to further capitalize on his photographic investments by publishing a photographic sketchbook of the war. Elegantly bound in gilded leather, Gardner gave individual photographers credit as artists, and he added evocative captions. For Harvest of Death, he wrote, quote, such a picture conveys a useful moral, 
It shows the blank horror and reality of war in opposition to its pageantry. Here are the dreadful details. Let them aid in preventing another calamity from falling upon the nation. Such an emphasis on reality rather than pageantry is part of why the primary way we encounter the Civil War today is through photography rather than painting. Though O'Sullivan may have arranged the bodies in a manner similar to how a painter would construct a landscape, his photograph offers a far more tangible expression of the Gettysburg battlefield than any painting. Photography also unraveled Reed's painting in another manner, through the development of shutter speeds fast enough to capture a horse in motion. In 1878, so only six years after Reed dies, with support from the California millionaire Leland Stanford, Edward Moybridge produced a series of photographs with the most accurate representation of a horse's gallop, therefore upending centuries of representation. Reed's painting of Rienzi's flying gallop was the accepted practice in 1871. But within the decade, artists would respond to Moybridge's photographs by changing their depictions to incorporate this new evidence. Thomas Aiken's May Morning in the Park of 1879 to 80 is an example of this. Critics at the time decried Aiken's horses as unnatural, but today it is Reed's painting that appears more awkward to 21st century viewers. In the 150 years since Reed's death, his painted and poetic memorials to Philip Sheridan have moved increasingly out of the public eye. This in part relates to Sheridan's later career. After the war, Sheridan was known for his leadership during the Chicago Fire of 1871 and his support for the establishment of the national parks. However, in the 21st century, Sheridan is a notorious name best known for the genocidal scorched earth tactics he pursued against the Sioux, Cheyenne, Kiowa, and Comanche nations in the Indian Wars. In addition to Sheridan's infamy, other aspects of the painting's recent neglect stems from how 21st century scholars have looked to paintings to find images of those who were historically underrepresented within the visual language of Civil War battlefields, black Americans. To conclude, I would like to make a brief comparison between Reed's painting and another equestrian portrait that details a different history of a Civil War battlefield, Eastman Johnson's 1862, A Ride for Liberty. Here, Johnson depicts an enslaved family galloping across a battlefield in pursuit of their freedom. During the Civil War, the Union Army declared that it would no longer recognize the Fugitive Slave Act, and therefore any enslaved Americans who crossed the Union line would be free. This declaration led to many courageous acts, such as the one Johnson captures here. And according to Johnson, he witnessed this exact family crossing the Manassas battlefield on March 2, 1862. And you can see, well, maybe you can't, but I'll tell you that the bayonets of the Union Army are glinting in the early dawn light just below the horse's nose. Placed alongside each other, the two paintings share many qualities. Both feature a horse moving from right to left across the scene, tail flying behind, while the animal makes direct eye contact with the viewer. Both feature a line of Union soldiers at left below an overcast, misty sky. And as painters, Reed and Johnson, they share remarkable similarities. Both were largely self-taught. Both visited Emanuel Leutz in, Ger in Germany. And though Johnson's painting was never exhibited in his lifetime, today it is among the most reproduced and studied paintings of the Civil War. Perhaps this is because in 2022, scholars are less interested in writing about the celebrities of the Civil War and more concerned with documenting and understanding the everyday acts of bravery and defiance that reshaped our nation. Thank you. When did color? color. 
So this, the color here, so I'm going to, I'm going to go back quite a lot to earlier in the, yes, so part, part of it is an aesthetic choice that Reed made to not have them be necessarily very brightly colored images. There's considerable differentiation across the various copies that he made. So let me just go to, I have a slide with two of them. There we go. So those are two, they're, they're not the same painting. They, they're copies that he made. The one on the right belonged to Ulysses Grant, and it was in his family until 1939 when they donated it to the Smithsonian. And so I think that it just was kind of what he was doing, what he was interested in. And he did not necessarily want to have a lot of color in it. Now the other images, oh, too, wrong way. So like this one was never printed in color. It was, this is a wood engraving that was printed in Harper's Weekly, and those were never printed in color. It was way too expensive to do quickly. The, the type of like relatively less expensive chromolithography doesn't really happen until the 1880s. And so like the inexpensive printed media doesn't, it's not in color at this point. The paintings when he was making them were pretty expensive to, to buy, and so that's why he did it. He was making good money off of them. And records show that he had planned to commission a lithograph in color, which also would have been relatively expensive to purchase. And so that was a way that he could earn money for himself. Yes, he, he did. Here, and I wonder if part of it might have also been ex, like to make it easier to, to produce a lot of them. Like if you look at both of them, he's paying the most attention to the portrait and the horse and the details of like the, the uniform. Having the more simple background probably made it easier to make a lot of them and at scale because they're not small paintings. Yes, Corinne. A little, yeah, it does. And I'm not as, like, it, that's a great question, and I should know better. Um, you know, it kind of does. The war paintings that I'm more familiar with are from, like, the 80s, the 1880s, and they do have this focus on the individual rather than the overall. I'm thinking of the great war paintings, which is, I mean, they're just not really Yeah, the large scale ones that, like, illustrate these European, those are, they're earlier. They tend to be, like, 18th century, early 19th century. And I think part of it is just, the, like, the style of military combat as well. Yes. I don't know. So he died. And he was he was survived by a daughter, and I don't know that she. I don't know what her issue, like if she had issue or not. So um, I, I don't know. It's a good question. So he's buried. Reed's buried in Laurel Hill, and I don't know whether his daughter was married buried there. So, I don't know. By any chance, the people that had the house now here today? Is it going to be in the museum? Are they still standing? Oh, yes. Yes, it's still standing. Um, I, you can't see it from the road, but if you go down uh, Corner Touch Road, you'll see the marker, and there's a driveway next to it. Oh, I, I'll get them. I mean, I know them. Um, <laughs> Edward, what do you want to ask? They do actually sell reproductions of it um, that, that incorporate all of the captions and the photographs. 
Audrey. I think a combination of both. I suspect that he had individual buyers who he, he knew would purchase it. Um, but on some level, he knew that it was going to be so popular that people would want to buy it. My suspicion is both. Um, because he also, so I didn't mention this, um, he sculpted a bust of Sheridan as well. So his very first training was as a sculptor, and, but we don't have anything, and I think that that bust is gone too. Like I don't know that it, it, I don't know where it was. It was in Italy though. So apparently like there's a story about him showing it to people in Italy in the, like before 71. What did you say? Someone in, in Europe, I don't, or if it came back. I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know what happened to it. Yes. I was talking to the model of Peter Greek for about 15 years, and there was a reenactor that lied to Black Horse and spoke to the Mustang, and he tried to go up there and wave his hat, and then tried to do the deal, and it was very good. I think it was. I think, I mean, it was a really amazing thing to do. And if if they hadn't rallied, the, the Confederates would have gotten all of those provisions because part of what was wearing them down is that their supplies were so limited. And so it would have been a boon for the Confederates. My son made um, a Union soldier out of clay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your kind attention and the really excellent questions. February.